discussion at all, Poonam? No. Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another Indo-Indians event. And this one is really special because this is, as we call it, an Indo-Indians event bridging between India and Indonesia. So Gandhiji was not a president or a prime minister. He was the father of the nation in India, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, affectionately known as Mahatma Gandhi or Bapu, as father. Today is his birth anniversary, Gandhi Jain. Gandhi did not belong to India alone. He belonged to the world. His teachings about non-violence and compassion, love, satyagraha, harmony, tolerance, unity in diversity have inspired many leaders across the globe. In India and in Indonesia. In Indonesia, both founding fathers Sukarno and Mohammed Hatta were inspired by Gandhi's teachings. Former President Abdul Rahman Wahid declared that Gandhi was his role model. We are very pleased and honored to welcome our chief guest today, Dr. Ilham Akbar Habibi, the chief guest. He is our chief guest and we're really, really honored. Thank you, uh, Dr. Habibi. Dr. Thank Ilham you very Habibi. much, uh, Mrs. Poonam, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you and namaste. He is the chief executive and national of the National ICT Council, Republic of Indonesia. Welcome, Pa Ilham. I would like to invite you to say a few words about Gandhi, especially if he has inspired you or some quotes of his that resonate with you. Yes. Thank you very much, Mrs. Poonam, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to say a few things. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm honored and I'm also very happy to be here and to share my thoughts as an opening remarks to this uh, very interesting session. Uh, when my dear friend and partner Sachin approached me, whether I would uh, be ready to give a few remarks to this distinguished forum, I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't know whether I would be adequate to do so. Uh, however, I, I, I studied the uh, quotes of... Uh, uh, Gandhi, and uh, I have to say, many, many things uh, resonate with me a lot. And I think that is because uh, Gandhi in his life has, well, I've seen the movie, it has been <laughs> some time ago, I mean, uh, decades ago when, uh, when this marvelous movie about Gandhi was there, I think it re received a, an Oscar or something, it was a very good movie. However, it is, of course, not sufficient to just watch the movie, one has to actually really study the person, Gandhi, to understand uh, from what kind of uh, life, or uh, I should say, uh, his uh, challenges and, and of life that he went through, and he grew with every challenge to a scale that uh, probably surpasses uh, most of us, if not all of us. And uh, until today, I think these quotes, they are still valid, they are timeless, and uh, I, I think that it's not that they were really invented by Gandhi, but I think he basically made it very clear in the context of, of what he went through to, to, to basically uh, come to this, the point to say things that he would feel and he would be very true to himself. And uh, basically by that, by his shining example, uh, motivate and uh, lead others in a very uh, non-violent way. I think this is the uh, peaceful way. This is probably the, the thing that most people would remember Gandhi. And uh, Mrs. Poonam, you uh, mentioned that I, I'm allowed to use a quote. And I, <laughs> yes, was, uh, I was really um, thinking very hard, which quote should I, should I use? Because there's so many that resonate very deeply with me. And I, I, I in the end, made a decision. And I think this is very, very deep. And it says, uh, if I quote here, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. It's a bit confusing in the beginning. How can you find yourself if you lose yourself? Right? <laughs> However, I mean, it is, I think my personal interpretation is basically what Gandhi speaks about is actually oneself. It is actually the ego, our ego. So this is us, maybe the ego 
And when we want to, the modern way to say this, or the contemporary, I should say this, it's not that Gandhi was not modern, he's always up to date, but it's basically transcending ego. What, what do we have to do in order to transcend our ego and to basically open ourselves to, to the world and life and really uh, understand what's true and what's not true without any amplification or any uh, filter through what is our ego. And ego is something uh, very, very difficult to overcome. And it needs some, in my view, my personal experience needs some major event. I mean, it, it, that is something people cannot steer in their lives. It might happen to some, it might not happen. For many people that I know, they would have to go through a near-death experience in order to have that transcending ego moment and understand where do I have to put myself in the world in order to understand or to, to do something meaningful for myself, for everybody else, for the world? It's, it's very difficult. And so I think what Gandhi is trying to suggest here is because that moment might never come. Some people will never have that moment. But you can reach something which you can control yourself. And this is basically you can lose yourself in the service of others. And that is a way, another way, there are many ways to, to achieve that. You can also reach that point through meditation. I found a lot of things uh, in the internet are, about meditation, very contemporary things about uh, there's, there's, there's whole seminars and webinars about this, hours and hours of, of things you have to go through in order to, 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 to be led to this path, to that track, to really transcend your ego. And I think uh, meditation is something you can find in in, in, in many religions, in many beliefs, in many traditions, uh, I think it's something universal that people, uh, the spiritual world is, has a connect to the real world through meditation in order to help one, ourselves to, to put us into a platform that actually transcends us and makes us a different person. And I think that is, uh, it sounds very complicated, but it is actually quite easy. We have to, in the end, in, in the beginning, I found it very difficult, but then in the end, I found it very easy that we have to indeed uh, lose us, the ego, in order to find us, again, our real ego. People speak about the illusionary ego and the timeless ego. So the timeless ego is something that we have to find. And what we think we are, the, the ego in terms of uh, what we are in this world, this is something that in many cases is probably adulterated by, by the world itself and we become something that we in fact don't want to. I think that's all I, 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 I have to say. And uh, I think that many quotes of Gandhi will lead us to pass and will reflect, put us on, the, on, on to reflect about so many things in this world, including ourselves. And uh, we can achieve, I think, many things through doing that. And that is something I can only recommend for everybody here. And I think everybody has done this already. I've seen the program and people are going to talk about various quotes of Gandhi and, and how they see themselves. And I think this is a very good thing to do uh, basically an exercise to check whether we are still on the right track or not. Thank you. And that's all from me. Thank you so much, uh, Pa Ilham. I think you've touched on a very important point. It's all about the more you give, the more you get. And uh, I remember that reminded me so much of what, what you said about ego, because when I went to Sagramati Ashram some years ago, I met the people there and I said, what do you think was the biggest learning you got from Gandhiji? And, you know, this old woman, she drew a circle in the sand and she said, he said, be the zero, be zero, be empty. Only when you are empty can it be filled with good things or good deeds. So what you touched upon was perfect, I think. And that is what you embody, service to others. And thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome, my pleasure. So today, in addition to Pa Ilham, we also have eight panelists. Stories have the power to change lives and connect individuals. Join our eight wonderful panelists who, where they share the quotes of Gandhiji that continue to inspire and celebrate a legacy. So today we'd like to start with Sachin. Uh, Sachin Gopalan is the co-founder at Orbit Future Academy. And his quote is, a man is but a product of his thoughts what he thinks he becomes. Sachin, over to you. Thank you, Poonam. Uh, well, uh, wishing everybody a great Gandhi Jayanti Day today, the 2nd of October. Uh, a man is a product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. Uh, you know, this quote 
uh, did not resonate with me at the early days of my life. But when I look back at my life, uh, it does make sense that everything that I have done has closely followed this one particular teaching of uh, Gandhi. So, you know, this is actually embedded in the law of attraction. What you think and desire, it will manifest over time. It can be there for your achievements. It can be for your values, your beliefs, your character. Everything is depending on what's in your head, in your brain, and how that's how it guides you and you know, makes you go and do things uh, in a certain way. So my earliest memory of this is actually a bit of a funny story. Uh, as a young boy of 12 years old, I used to watch all my elders going to work, and I had to go to school. But the fun thing we would do in our homes, we would all wake up in the morning and read a newspaper. And that's how I got to know what's happening around the world. And you know, the best thing is, I used to think that wouldn't be the best thing if I had a job where I got paid to read the newspaper every day. <laughs> and you know, lo and behold, 30 years later, I joined a media group that owns newspapers and I became the head of the company. And I was doing that exactly every morning. I used to wake up in the morning, read the newspaper. That has worked for me. I didn't feel like it was work. It's just an example, right? Something that was early on embedded in my head made me change so many different career decisions. I was, I'm an engineer by, uh, you know, by education. And I didn't do engineering. I applied engineering to media and, you know, it completely changed my life. There are other such instances. Uh, I remember very clearly wanting to be my own boss and uh, everything I would do kind of got, uh, you know, it, uh, conditioned my mind to take those kind of decisions which would lead me to that particular goal, right? Uh, I achieved it at a re relatively young age, but it was not about wealth. It was not about creating empires. To be my own boss was having the freedom of time, the choice to do what I like, not what my boss liked or boss wanted me to do or another company wanted me to do. I think that was a meaningful thing for me because I felt that there are certain things I would like to do and explore and that would be my journey. So that's another example of how, you know, in my mind, I used to think of things I want to do. And I was, I have this habit even now. I think I do, I call it fast forward. <laughs> I would fast forward myself five, 10 years and imagine what do I need to do today in order to get there in five to 10 years. So it's, you know, so what the lesson here is, this applies to your personal life too, not just work, your family life, your social life, and it works without fail. You know, everything you think about, it gets crafted in that way. And that means the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not only good things. You think bad things, that's exactly what manifests. So you think happy thoughts, you're happy. If you have positive things uh, are thought of, that's what happens. See, so if you think bad or negative things, that's what you get. Your subconscious somehow takes over and guides your actions and reactions in order to make that state a reality. And it's a subconscious, you know, it really does. If you reflect and think about it, you do realize that it's a, it's, it's a mantra that work, it, it just works in the background. So uh, how does Gandhiji play a big role here? Because I think he did exactly the same thing. He practiced it. There were many examples of it. If somebody went to him for a certain thing, he would actually not answer, but they would go back and practice it first. And only when he was convinced that he believed in it and he could think about it, he would then give advice about it. And, you know, and he took the trouble to understand in his mind. And I think, you know, that's the biggest learning we have today, that if we are having thoughts and actions, whatever they may be, good, bad, or ugly, it is what you become. And it is what happens to you as you go through life. So with that, you know, Poonam, I, that is what I would like to share. A quote, Thank I you. believe, is a very powerful way for us to change our own destiny. Thank you, Sachin. In fact, thought are indeed thoughts are indeed things, and whatever you think, you become. And you mentioned that little story about Gandhiji. So I remember that once an old woman went to him uh, with her son and said, "Gandhiji, tell my son to stop eating sweets." So Gandhiji told her, "Please come after a week." So when they went again after a week, he told the son, "Stop eating sweets." So she says, "Why couldn't you tell him that a week earlier?" He says, because I had to stop eating sweets for a week before I could tell him. So exactly what you said, you know, practicing what you think and what you want, how you want to be, how you want to appear in this world. Thank you, Sachin. Our next speaker is uh, Ibu Yuli Ismartono. She was the former chief editor of Tempo English Edition, managing editor of Asia Views blog, and now with the Lontar Foundation. She sits 
on the boards for New York-based Natural Resources Governance Institute, Geneva-based Medicine for Malaria Ventures, Bangkok-based Altasian Burma Prestasi Junior Indonesia, and in Jakarta, and the Coral Triangle Center in Bali. And she has two grandsons. And she is a dynamo. She's an amazing person. Yuli and her, um, and her quote for today is, happiness is when you, what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Yuli, over to you. Yuli, you are on mute. Ibu Yuli, you need to unmute. <laughs> Hello, Ibu Yuli. I think she's uh, maybe uh, she can't hear us. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next uh, panelist in the meantime. I'd like to introduce Abhay Kapoor. Abhay leads DM Pratama Group, an independent, successful, and one of the largest communications groups in Indonesia offering integrated advertising services to multiple brands in categories ranging from cosmetics to cars. And his quote today is, live as you were to die tomorrow. Learn as you were to live forever. Abhay, over to you. Sorry, even I was on mute. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for having me as part of the panel and uh, happy Gandhi Jayanti to all of you and everyone who's tuned in. Uh, I would like to divide this quote into two parts. Part one is live like you were to die tomorrow. How do we live these days? Most of us live as if we are going to live forever. And when you think that you're going to live forever, it leads to procrastinations and it leads to prioritization. What are the things that we prioritize? We prioritize work, we prioritize career, we prioritize fame, success, money, and all material achievements. What do we deprioritize and procrastinate? We deprioritize and procrastinate things that make us happy. Things like building relationships, investing uh, time with friends, family, uh, building hobbies, things that really, really matter to us in the long run and make us happy. When we prioritize wrong things in life, maybe not wrong things, but if the priority prioritization is too skewed towards material achievements, what happens later in life? It leads to regrets. And one of the palliative uh, professionals who take care of the dying has recorded the top five uh, regrets of the dying very well. And those regrets are ranging from, I wish I had not worked so hard, to saying that I wish I had spent time with friends and family. Not a single regret there says that I wish I had earned more money. I wish I was more famous. So coming back to the quotation, I think we need to live life as if we are going to die tomorrow in a way that we do not procrastinate. We do not skew our prioritizations in life. The way I relate to this part of the quote is, uh, is an anecdote. Um, I call it as the wheelchair dance. My mom, for a long part of her life, was wheelchair ridden uh, towards the end. And it was this, um, uh, this party, family party, where we were all there. And people asked her to join the fun. And joined she did. She came onto the dance floor on a wheelchair and with hand gestures and expressions, she danced to a Bollywood number, old Bollywood number. And that whole dance floor transformed into 150 guests surrounding her, cheering her, applauding her for her zest for life. Now that is the image which is embedded in my mind, which says, live as if you're going to die tomorrow. My mom obviously lived for a much longer time after that doing good for the society, doing good for the people that she loved. But my 
personal image when I think of my mom and what she taught her, uh, taught us as children is this particular image of her uh, dancing on the wheelchair and saying, live as if you're going to die tomorrow. Second part of the quote is um, learn like you will live forever. It is said about the brain, either use it or lose it. When you don't lose your brain, what happens is that the blood uh, is circulated by the heart to the other parts of the body, not to the brain, and brain shrinks in size. So to keep the brain going, to keep your mental fitness going, you need to keep learning. And you will keep learning because the biggest teacher of them all, which is life, does not stop teaching. It always keeps teaching us new things. Learning does not stop for us after getting a degree, a diploma, or landing up a job. That is, in fact, the beginning. We have to upskill ourselves. We have to keep learning, keep growing, even to stay relevant at work. And to stay relevant in life, there's this example that the entire humanity has gone through during pandemic. We all had to shift our lives from an offline world to the online world. And the, uh, the shift, even the most technology unsavvy of us had to learn to shop, to work, to connect with the family, to know about the pandemic. Everything had to be shifted online. So there was something new that all of us learned there. And personally, the way I connect with this, I started learning how to write Hindi poetry. And uh, at the age of 55 plus, sorry, I, I, I gave away my age. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, I would like to quote a couple of uh, lines from the poetry, which is about learning and which is about uh, dreaming. Sapno ki patang urane se kya umr hame rok paegi? Jab soch patang uraegi, tabhi to hawa use uthaegi. Jab soch ki door choti hogi. So how can we do Just to conclude, I think life can be only understood backwards in retrospect, but it has to be lived forward and uh, it can be lived well forward only if we uh, live a meaningful life, a happy life and a life that is going to fulfill us, including learning all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Abhay. That was very, very relevant and uh, I think it applies to each and every one. Thank you for sharing and beautiful lines of poetry there. Thank you. I'd like to go back to Yuli. Uh, Yuli, your um, quote as you know, amazing woman, really a dynamic powerhouse and so relevant that and appropriate that her uh, quote is happiness is when you, what you think, what you say and what you do are in harmony. Yuli, over to you. Thank you, Poonam. I'm not that great because I wasn't unable to <laughs> unmute. But anyway, I apologize to everybody. But Poonam, I would like to commend you. I, I think this is a great uh, program that you're doing. Uh, 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 um, you know, uh, bringing together people to hear their thoughts on Gandhi. Now, mind you, not everybody. I, I wasn't a big follower of Gandhi, but I did learn about him. But anyway, I'd like to say something about the definition of happiness. I lived in India some years ago, and I know only too well what an icon he was. I know of him from history books in school, and at Lady Sri Ram College in New Delhi, while studying for my BA, I came to know about Gandhi from my college mate, Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma, who was studying there and who is saw now sadly under house arrest again. But while she read Gandhi, I will listen to Elvis Presley. So, uh, but she, she always was, you know, trying to inform me, ask me to read about Gandhi. So I did. But I have long admired Gandhi as a proponent of nonviolence and as a leader in the struggle for India's independence. But I will be honest and confess that I have not read much, let alone study his philosophical outlook in life. So when Poonam asked me to choose one of his sayings, I chose the one that I could personally relate with, and that is about happiness. 
which is when, when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. How very true. But honestly, how many of us can actually admit to having, to achieving that kind of perfect, serendipitous, and harmonious happiness? One goes through life with ups and downs, trial and terror, error and terror too, and lots of unpredictability. You may start with good intentions, and think and say that you will do something. But can you actually claim to have done according to your original goal, to your original um, objective? As another saying goes, man proposes, but God disposes. Meaning we can make all the plans we want, but if what if something comes up to make them not happen? How many times in your life have you thought of doing something planned it, and just when you think you've got it, something goes wrong. Today, for example, how many plans and projects went astray with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic? Gandhi's definition of happiness is so deep, so spiritual, seemingly unachievable to me. Yet I believe people aspire to their own kind of doable happiness. Even as a kid, you are taught to be happy with little things. You fall, you hurt, and your mother gives you a candy. There, are you happy now? And as you grow up, other things make you happy, like graduating, getting a job you like, and getting a soul mate. And when the kids come along, you're happy and relieved that they grow up healthy, drug-free, and graduate from school. I have my own simple happiness. I am happy that when I play golf, none of my balls go in the water or out of bounds. What, I'm, what I'm, is, I'm saying may, be, may seem shallow and superficial, but hey, isn't life like that? We live from day to day, aiming for the little bits of happiness we can get to achieve that big one. And that is life. And I interpret Gandhi's definition of happiness as being just that, life and living. Which is why I believe that Gandhi's saying about happiness goes very well with another, although quite a different icon, and that is John Lennon of the Beatles. He said, when I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life. So for me, Gandhi is more than an inspiration. His words are a gentle daily reminder of what life is or should be and what one makes of it. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Guna. Thank you so much, Yuli. I think those are uh, you know, amazing how you linked Lenin to Gandhi and that's such a wonderful bridge uh, which connects happiness. It's a happy thought and I hope and pray that none of your golf balls ever go in the water. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist today is somebody that we all know of if we are living in Indonesia is Janet Denif. She's the founder and director of Ubud a food festival and Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. Her latest book is Bali, Food of My Island Home, following her memoir, Fragrant Rice. She's also the owner of Casa Luna, Indus Restaurant, and Honeymoon Guest House and Bakery in Ubud. And her quote today is, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Janet, over to you. Thank you so much, Poonam, and uh, I'm really honored to be part of this lineup today um, as a, a token of Aussie uh, Indonesian. Yeah? So, um, yeah, my quote is, the one I selected is, yeah, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Uh, when I um, first came to India, I, I used to go every year to see the Jaipur uh, Literary Festival, and uh, I guess, um, like, uh, was said before, my, I guess my first experience of Gandhi in a way, if you call it experience, was the Richard Attenborough film, uh, which for me in Melbourne at that time was uh, quite extraordinary. Um, 
amazing to see someone who lived in that way. But so when I came back, uh, I remember I had been reading about Gandhi and uh, it's hard not to be impressed, of course, and to see how he still, as you say, is the father of a nation, you know, and you can see his presence very much so. And then I remember visiting his place in Mumbai and to see his little bedroom and all in there was in there was a spinning wheel and a cupboard. So this is off the track a bit, but when my kids were growing up and they were asking for things, and even when they were teenagers, they'll all remember that I used to always say to them, all you ever need in life is a spinning wheel and a cupboard. So uh, that's it. I said that especially to my daughters, you know, when they were continually asking for things. But anyway, um, yeah, I chose that quote, in a gentle way you can shake the world because it's, um, it's really, I, for me, it's the way I operate actually. And uh, you know, if, if I think of it in terms of how I um, organise the Ubud Writers Festival with the team, uh, my whole um, philosophy in a way is by being gentle because I find that being gentle uh, to me is the most powerful position that you can have by, uh, by not being aggressive or angry. I feel by being gentle, you achieve more clarity and you can deliver those messages. You can shake the world or you can shake people around you or you can achieve greatness by that same non-violent, gentle way. And when you're gentle, it actually creates a gentleness by others around you. So when you're dealing with anger, if you face that with anger, then you're going to mulotus like a volcano yet. But if you're gentle, then it's that calming way that calms people down and allows them to see things in a, in a broader way. Actually, before I moved to Bali, I used to be a, a teacher. And so it was sort of interesting because, you know, you'd go into classrooms with young teenagers who were, were aggressive and kind of angry and full of crazy hormones. And so I sort of experimented with tactics as well and realized that when, again, you use that whole gentle way in teaching with groups, you can actually start to yeah have that effect. It's like a ripple effect on those around you or the students. I used to experiment by, you know, being gentle and lowering my voice, just going down, down, down until people stopped to listen. So again, uh, gentleness for me is very powerful. As I said, yep, yeah, it can help you shake the world. It can help you shake your own little world. It can help you with your relationships, with your with your family, and helps you also by just being a calmer person with a broader vision because it helps you achieve greatness because it allows you again to stand back. And I think also you know, talking about COVID and the pandemic, uh, the sort of frustrations that everybody experiences just by being gentle, by being calm, it can help you see forward, you know, see the light and again, uh, help you make changes and, and achieve what you're hoping to achieve. So that's my little bit about being gentle. I'm a huge fan of gentleness, gentleness and, uh, I find Gandhi extraordinary and I think he taught us so many, many wonderful things. Thank you, Janet. I think that's such a wonderful way to put it, that gentleness is powerful. And I think we that is a defining character when we come to Indonesia. People here are gentle and polite and warm. And, you know, these are little things that when we come to Indonesia, this is something that we learn from the people here. So this is lovely. Thank you, Janet. Moving on, we have Mariko. Mariko Asmara Yoshihara is one of the most active angel impact investors in Indonesia. Mariko has set herself the mission to improve the livelihoods of marginalized children and youth. After spending 20 years hunting for senior talents with JAC recruitment, she is now fully dedicated to mentoring social businesses that build human capital at the grassroots. And Mariko's quote is, the future depends on what you do today. Mariko, over to you. 
Thank you, Poonam. Thank you for giving a chance. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here uh, together with all uh, significant, uh, excellent uh, panelists. Uh, let me talk about uh, a bit about background of myself. Uh, my name is Mariko. I'm, uh, I'm not young anymore. I'm 53 years old. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming from mixed Japanese and Indonesian. A bit weird, uh, uh, weird uh, what do you call it, um, uh, 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 combination. Um, I mostly work in two countries, which is uh, Japan and Indonesia. Uh, from 2016, I choose my profession actually to become the uh, a business uh, social enterprise uh, uh, impact investors. Um, and but I do have another job, which is that it's quite similar like Abbey, actually, that my mother got uh, a, a big uh, incident and then uh, she, is, she, she has uh, uh, difficulties to walk. So then I need to actually to take care of her. Uh, and so she is living uh, with a wheelchair at the moment. These are two incidents, uh, two, two, uh, two, uh, two things that happen actually in, a quite, uh, uh, in, in quite a similar period of my time. Until 2019, I, uh, I can say that my life was quite uh, pretty, uh, uh, what do you call it, boring. So then I, I was uh, totally driven by fear. So then as entrepreneur, uh, you really want to show that actually you did a very good job in your business and whatever. So then I'm collecting all the medals. I'm collecting all the achievements. Um, I'm, I'm cutting all the articles that actually that uh, allows uh, the articles actually to, uh, to, to say something about my company. And I, I had so much uh, uh, struggle in my, uh, in my life uh, because uh, because my base of my life is actually fear and affirmation. My husband husband kept asking me, Mariko, why did you keep asking every day? Are you uh, do you love me? That's that the type of a, that is actually can tell you how that actually that how uh, how how big my fear on that time. Until that one incident actually that ha helped me to actually to to uh, to make clear all my goals, which is if you remember about the uh, Marriott bomb too. Um, that one is on uh, uh, July 17, 2019. I was one of the victim uh, uh, in, in that poor marriage too. I didn't want to say about the drama, but the drama is actually helping me to have a very clear about, about where that actually I uh, need to go and then where it is the purpose of my life. Um, I keep asking myself that why that I, I need to actually to go through this, uh, this, uh, uh, this incident. And my husband and family wanted me to actually to go back to, uh, to Japan. And they wanted me to actually to rescue and then wanted me to go to Japan. But I say no, I prefer to stay here. So my driver, my staff actually that really taking care of me very well during my uh, healing uh, uh, process. Uh, it's about six months I, didn't, I was not able to walk. Um, um, a lot of a uh, a lot of uh, journalists came to my room and then they they asked uh, what did, uh, what was what, what did you feel and what uh, what was the what is the message that you want to say to the universe? Somehow I never I didn't uh, it, it didn't come across to myself that actually that I want to say bad thing about the terrorists, but with the things that actually that I keep like they put it in my mind is actually do I actually do I. Uh, make this thing happen because my ignorance. So I feel that actually I was not really having a connection with the poor. I, I just only had my good time. I had a good uh, uh, a good life as a as an entrepreneur as a business person, and I didn't really bother about the marginal uh, uh, the marginal group. I didn't even under I didn't understand why that actually they didn't get what they they supposed to have. Okay, so I thought they were just only lazy, and then they, they choose for not uh, doing what they uh, they're supposed to do. Okay, so then uh, after the incident, it happened that actually that uh, uh, I I choose to actually to 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 think twice about uh, what is the purpose of my life. And uh, in 2016, I choose to actually to step up, uh, step down from my uh, my career, and I left my company. And then I wanted to do something. So then I believe that actually that probably I could I couldn't do so much, but I really want to get involved. I really want to get involved the population for where that actually that I can help them for those people that who have the low income, uh, which is that it's about uh, 215 million people in Indonesia that who have about a low uh, a super low income. 
one family probably only uh, receiving about two million a month, uh, I think. So this kind of type of family, they, they struggle with their life. Uh, while that actually we struggle, but the totally in a different thing. But I, but during that my period of my time to actually to start to understand about social business enterprise, I found also there's a lot of a uh, lesson that I learned from them. Even though they are not a very ha uh, having, uh, uh, they don't have enough uh, money to actually to spend, but actually they are the, probably the most happiest people, even more than myself. So I learned about abundance. I learned about love. I learned about passion. I learned about how to care other people uh, from these people that I thought that I uh, they are uh, they are in a marginal uh, 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 group. Uh, as you notice, also uh, uh, seventy five percent point six seventy five percent of uh, population of Indonesia they spend below five million, okay, uh, per month, and then they do they do they do have lots of problem with their struggle with their life. Um, again, I'm asking to myself uh, how that I can make it that it happen. So then now I actually I become uh, I I make a firm that we just that uh, helping uh, uh, this uh, marginal through our investment, and then I'm take, uh, taking a punam also and taking a, a lots of a good people, good-hearted people to actually to become uh, the ecosystem. So this is what I do, and I believe that actually the future depends on what we do today. So I hope that I reach with the small movement that I do right now, that we can we can do a little bit impact to the in the future. Thank you, Puna. Sorry, it's a bit uh, too long. Thank you. Thank you, Mariko. Thank you for sharing your story. Very, very inspiring. And yes, I, I really appreciate and salute you for taking a stand and saying that what I do today is the foundation of what you want the future to be. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to move to Wendy Kusumwa Vidokdo, is the executive director of Yayasan Helping Hands, a non-profit charity whose mission is to promote inclusivity specifically for the disabled through character development programs that are inclusive and collaborative, providing platforms where people of disability and non-disability can meet, engage, and learn from one another. Her quote from Gandhi is, it's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time, that there only that there'll be any fruit, but that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action, but if you do nothing, there'll be no result. Wendy, over to you. Thank you, Poonam. And thank you so much, Punam, for inviting me um, to be among an esteemed uh, panel today. Um, this quote really moved me, and um, I, I this quote really uh, sparked uh, a reflection within me. And uh, my reflection kind of revolved uh, about the power of now. Uh, and I thought, when one focuses on the present moment and on being intentional, and purposeful about one's actions. The result will rarely shape them. When one is centered on the now, one will focus on being a person of integrity that's about doing the right thing despite adversity, opposition, or objection, or despite the outcome not transpiring instantly. When one focuses on the present moment, one will not be chasing what deviates from their purpose in life. In my work in inclusive education for youth uh, in the U.S. and Helping Hands, specifically youth with disability, I learned over and over again that this work and any work uh, like Gandhi's work is always an uphill battle. That every day you sow the seed of knowledge, passion, kindness to young people. You're doing it in, only in the hopes that one day it will grow to be a big fruitful tree. In my work of empowering the disempowered and disenfranchised, many times there's more obstacles in the way than clear open road. But never lose focus and never lose hope. Come back to the center, come back to your purpose. So to me, finally, do the thing that you're scared of the most that you believe to be true. 
and you might just might kindle the light within yourself and, and others. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. So powerful. And I, uh, you know, it's amazing and important that we work in an inclusive society. And uh, congratulations on moving on that path and with full power, more power to you. Thank you, Poonam. Our next panelist is Anuj Gupta. Anuj is the head of sales and marketing for the delivery business CRM and digital for Burger King Indonesia. His quote is, the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. Anuj, over to you. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you so much, uh, Poonamji, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not going to say that I'm very young, but uh, I think uh, experience-wise, I think I'm, I'm still, uh, still a lot to learn. And I'm very glad to learn so many stories about uh, Yuli, uh, her classmate being Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, that's just amazing. And then, you know, uh, lots of other work uh, that's, that's happening uh, with Priya San or social entrepreneurship and things like that. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back, I'll come, straight away come to my, where uh, of, of my quote, yeah, what my favorite quote is. Um, I think, um, well, I had written a whole script about it, but I think uh, uh, it again, like, you know, whatever was said, it also made me, made me think while I was listening, listening to it, that I think um, while, when Mahatma Gandhi said that, um, he was referring more about uh, what was happening at that time. But I think it, it had more far reaching and uh, a more, um, uh, it had a longevity of, of what he said at that time. Um, um, and, and, and basically saying that, like, he referred to, you know, solving world problems by the efforts of each individual uh, and collectively with all of which uh, makes a difference. Um, I think what he appealed uh, to was the awakening of the inner self, which knows itself better, right? And all the change and transition happens from there, right? And uh, so I, Poonamji knows me quite well. I love history. I, I, I read a lot. Uh, I watch a lot of uh, stuff on history and I've always been like this, uh, current affairs and things like that. Um, and I think um, uh, what I've realized is that, uh, that what I've done in the past uh, or anybody has done in the past affects uh, what you have done today. Um, I have done a lot of reading of, uh, uh, maybe I, I would say uh, with little confidence more than what other people read about history in schools. And, uh, and I think this, this quote has um, uh, made a big change uh, in, in how I take things. Uh, and I'm not talking about being a social reformer here. I'm, 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 I'm a nobody uh, in, in that way, right? Uh, but I think um, what I believe in, in doing my bit is, is, is uh, being a good mentor. I, I, I like being a big, good mentor. And I think in my current job also, what I do and I'm very passionate about is, 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 uh, is delivery business for working, right? But uh, what I do affects uh, the employment at the store. So I think that drives me a lot, right? And I think um, uh, it's, it's the, and we, if you go back to the uh, uh, being relevant to uh, the, the, the food, I think uh, uh, it, it, I always question myself that, is this enough? Is that my full potential, right? Can I do something more? Can I do something more? Can I get some more, more? So, and it's not about sales, right? It's, it's about, and, and when I see uh, uh, when, when what happens, what I do affects so many people, then it actually really challenges me that, oh, you know what? Uh, I can I, I, at least I cannot affect the whole world, uh, but I can at least affect five thousand people or ten thousand people, and I think that's enough for me, at my level, right? And I'm very happy that I'm able to affect uh, so many lives, right? Um, so I come from a uh, just a little bit of myself, like you know, and, and then I'll, I'll connect you also what what I feel uh, very uh, passionate about. I come from a tier three town uh, called Bilai. Uh, I mean, if you Google it, you will find it. Uh, where I think becoming a doctor or engineer was the biggest achievement and the only thing that you should you, you could do, doctor or engineer, right? Uh, well, I did become an engineer because I, I'm very fond of technology and mathematics and all of that. But uh, uh, I all, I think uh, just a little bit on, on the quote also that, you know, uh, uh, it also makes a question that are you really, um, uh, uh, is, is, is this what you want to do? 
and um, so in 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 a when you when you are in an engineer you all the the, the clear path is that oh you become a uh, become a software uh, engineer and things like that i asked my, myself that do i want to do that i said no i don't want to do that right and so i started my own company uh, well uh, long story short uh, it didn't do well but what i learned was being an being enterprising right and i think that that has made a big change uh, uh, in 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 uh, in myself is 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 questioning myself challenging myself that is this enough is this enough uh, uh, that i can contribute is there more i can do right uh, which not just affects me but uh, the the entire self uh, well i can go on but i think uh, we since we have limited time i would uh, uh, i would again thank you so uh, i would thank uh, punandi especially and, and the whole whole panel uh, uh, learn a lot and uh, thank you so much for uh, 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 making me part of this uh, yeah thanks so much thank you anuj yes you touched upon a very important point all about the power of one and how each of us one of us has a power to make a huge difference to the world around us the more we think about that the more power we have so thank you for sharing our next speaker is somebody that we love means all the people in indonesia you should see his seminars there are like 5000 people 8000 people before the pandemic and that's james v indonesia's favorite trainer and seminar speaker his quote is strength does not come from physical capacity it comes from an indomitable will hi james welcome hi punam thank you so much hello good evening everybody first of all punam thank you so much congratulations for organizing this uh, wonderful event yeah and thanks for making me part of it it's such an honor uh friends you know the my first uh, knowledge of gandhi was from my father yeah uh, he he was an avid reader uh well he lived through the second world war and all that so one of his heroes was gandhi yeah and uh so uh, my first encounter was his book uh, sayings of gandhi until now i still have it with me the sayings of gandhi and then my most comprehensive education of gandhi was from the ben kingsley movie <laughs> gandhi yeah so my recollection of gandhi my understanding of gandhi when we think of when i visualize gandhi it is the gandhi movie just like when i visualize moses it is the charlton heston of the 10 commandments you know so uh, well uh, punam has given me this topic yeah strength i give she punam gave me several choices uh, strength comes not from physical capability it comes from an indomitable will yeah and uh well how does this quote resonate with me how does this resonate with me yeah uh well let's go indomitable will i i just wanted to make sure i check the dictionary it means impossible to subdue or defeat well wow, that's something pretty big yeah indomitable will is something that is impossible to subdue or defeat that means it's got to be something that's pretty tough Yeah. Now, how does this resonate with me? First of all, uh, yeah, as Punam said, I train people, and I train mostly sales people at that. Okay. So, by nature of the job, sales people face the most rejections on a daily basis. You know. So you've got to have solid resolve. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. Right. So, and I train people like that. Uh, I help them to develop the communication skills, their scaling skills, you know, and uh, they come away more confident, more uplifted. But I know deep in their hearts they have this apprehension. With all these communication skills and uh, selling skills, will I make it? Will I close the sale tomorrow? Or, or I was? Will I still be rejected? And they know. Yeah, on a law of averages, they will face more rejections than acceptance, right? Okay, and I also know, uh, at the moment, they are going to face a lot more rejections, proportionately a lot more rejections, until they come to a point where they reach their tipping point, where they have achieved their uh, proverbial one thousand out one thousand ten thousand hours, right? And when they achieve that. well things get easier right but you and i know until they achieve that tipping point there will be more rejections than acceptance rejection after rejection after rejection and 
in order to get to that tipping point, in order to achieve targets, in order for things to be easier, they've got to have that strength. They've got to have that indomitable will in the face of obvious rejections, in the face of obvious failures, they've still got to get up and fight it. So that's indomitable will, okay? Then I ask another question. So if that's the case, yeah, are certain people more predestined to have indomitable will while others are less so? Are there characteristics that tell them apart, right? From our experience, your experience and my experience, Probably not, yeah, uh, because we hear of success stories everywhere, right, across all walks of life. You know, I do training for salespeople in life insurance, property, network marketing, and of course, all the other kinds of automotive, banks, and all that. But I highlight life insurance, property, and network marketing, because in these three uh, industries, the recruitment is almost open field, right? Anybody can be a life insurance agent if you pass the test. Anybody can sell property, yeah? Anybody can be a network marketer, right? So from a manager, a graduate, a foreign graduate, a local graduate, to a housewife, even a truck driver can, can, can be a network marketer, right? So we've seen highly educated, young people, strong, good looking, but not making it. Failing as life insurance agent, failing as property agents, failing miserably in network marketing. And yet we see inexperienced, lesser educated office workers, truck drivers, housewives who've never gone to work, go on to become top agents and top leaders, right? So, uh, you education is not the thing, right? Physical capability is not the thing. The indomitable will is that thing. Right. So, going back to the quote, strength does not come from physical capability, it comes from an indomitable will. Well, that is given, no disputes, right? So, the question then is, how does one come to possess this indomitable will, All right? So, if everybody can have it, and seemingly everybody does across the board, across the world, then how does one possess it, right? Because if you possess it, obviously you can achieve great things, right? So, how does one possess it, okay? Uh, three points. Maybe history can shed some light, yeah? Gandhi, Churchill, Sokarno, Lee Kuan Yew, I mean, there's great people, great leaders, yeah? Uh, well, they obviously, each and every one of them overcame indomitable problems, they had strength of will and so on, right? Uh, how, how did they come to have it? For most of these world leaders, yeah, they they had a great sense of calling, right? They had a great sense of calling, a great sense of their moment in history, you know, and they had this great sense of, if not me, who else? Gandhi had that, if not me, who else, right? Okay, right? Churchill had that. <laughs> he had to lead the English people in the face of the Nazi, Nazi onslaught, right? So Kano had that, Lee Kuan Yew on a much scale, smaller scale, had that too. They had that sense of calling, that sense of, uh, you know, it, it is me, it's my moment, I have to lead the way, I have to carry the sword or whatever. If not me, who else? That sense of calling and that sense of mission that gave them that strength, that gave them that will, okay? Then there's another category of people. The Nicholas Teslas, the Albert Einsteins, the Steve Jobs, the Alexander Graham Bells, even the Roger Bannisters, the Michael Phelps, the Rudy Hatono, for example. These people also obviously overcame tremendous odds, right? They had indomitable will too, right? But they are not historians, okay? They are not great politicians and so on. They are not great leaders in that sense. But they had that will because they had that tremendous sense of purpose, right? You know, they had that tremendous, tremendous sense of adventure, right? To harness electricity, you know, and to channel electricity, to create that light bulb, right? To put the computer, which until then was huge, to put that computer onto everybody's desk, you know, to, uh, to, to invent an, an, an equipment, a gadget that grandmothers can speak to grandchildren across the country, you know, that kind of sense of purpose, that sense of adventure, and obviously that passion in what they're doing, right? They are so yes. passionate about it that a failure is not a failure, a failure is part of the adventure, 
Right, right James. So, I think, uh, James, that's a very valid point you just made about purpose and indomitable will. I'll have to stop you now. I'm so sure. sorry. Thank you. I think we are running out of time. Definitely. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you James. so much, Punam. Thank you Thank so much, you. everybody. Yes, indomitable will and your salesperson uh, talk, I will never forget. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think it was an honor to have all the panelists together. I think their stories are so varied and so interesting, and each one has a lesson. I think we are learning from each and every one of them how things have shaped their lives and how it is an inspiration for each one of us. Even after his death, Gandhiji's legacy lives on as Asia's biggest democracies and pluralistic societies India and Indonesia must work hand in hand to achieve global peace in adherence to the great teachings of Satyagraha and nonviolence. And this is what it's all about. In a gentle way, we can shape the world. And if it's to be, it's up to me. Each one of us has the power. So thank you so much, everyone. I think it has been a huge pleasure to have each and every one of you here with me today. And I really appreciate each and every one of you Thank you so much, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you India. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.